Hey there, and welcome to another bonus episode. I recently did an interview with Sarah Weinman, who is an author, journalist, and a former writer at Publishers Marketplace. And we took a little side trip into the current state of publishing. So if you're interested in a little behind the scenes look at the industry, including a view going back to the early mid, early to mid 2000s, well, you can come along with us. We touch on mergers and then the recent layoffs at Penguin Random House last week and the retirement of some major figures in editorial and especially romance at a Avon HarperCollins. We also talk about the introduction of AI, the continuation of free labor in the form of fans and readers on social media platforms. I really like talking to Sarah Weinman, not only because all podcasts are good with extra Sarah's W, but Sarah's been doing this for a really long time. And I hope you enjoy this little, you know, behind the scenes discussion of where publishing is and yet how we remain hopeful for its future. Thank you again for being part of the podcast Patreon. I cannot tell you how much your support means. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, on with the bonus episode. Now, I do have a somewhat silly question. How much overlap is there covering true crime and your former life covering publishing? You said something very funny the other day about how you look at publishing and they're like, do you even want to make money? Is that a thing? Well, do they? I don't know. I could not I don't... possibly tell you. So for a long time, I worked as a publishing reporter for Publishers Marketplace. And yes. that was the last day job that I had. It was the best day job that I had. That's where I, I would see so you much. at conferences. Yes. We'd run around as Sarah's W. Absolutely. Sometimes and I people thought so you were me because they'd see the Sarah and the W and they'd miss the rest of my well, interview. Well, like, we're oh, also I'm we're both dark haired and, yeah. you know, yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I love that job. I, I It also was exhausting in a lot of different ways. And I am eternally grateful for having that job and so glad I'm not covering it now because I think especially the way that the business is going it just feels weirder and sadder and and yet also very much in keeping with how weird and sad it has been in the past I mean I I re, I wasn't at Publishers Marketplace then but I was writing about book publishing during the 2008 collapse yeah. and how many people lost their jobs and how many imprints were closed and what was changing. And I think there's always just a, a binge and purge element to the business. Yeah. In large part because they're scared and they don't know how to. It's not that they don't know how to keep up with the times. It's just that the times keep changing and the sense of how to market books is often outside of the control of publishers. Yeah. That they're at the be, they're at the they're beholden to the whims of people like Amazon, and TikTok, and yeah. now AI. So when you introduce a new element that just threatens to disrupt to, to disrupt stuff, yeah. it can just be really terrifying. But they're also, I think, taking it out on exactly the wrong people, <laughs> and so as a result, authors are just like, "What do we do? Who who yeah? Who do we who do we trust here?" I wonder if one of the reasons I ended up writing Scoundrel 2 is because it was the nexus of true crime and publishing. It really was. I mean, that was exactly I mean, I, your house of wheels, as I like it, to say. It, I mean, nobody else could have told that story the way that I told it. Nope. And to some degree with The Real Alita too, it was also a book publishing story because yeah. I was writing about a book, the creation and publication of Lolita, particularly in America. And you can and translate so, that world, like you can explain to the reader, okay, so here's how weird it is that this right. editor is writing Sexy Times letters. Like, let's discuss that for just a minute here. Yeah. Right. So because I have the specialized knowledge of how book publishing actually works, that meant works. that I could put, <laughs> right, that I could put in context, it meant that I could put in context why, in particular, Sophie Wilkins's behavior was not the usual behavior. Even within a a completely dysfunctional industry that is book publishing, and particularly the book publishing of the 1960s, which was a very transformative time because it was the first decade when non-publishing corporations took an interest. Yeah. So early in the decade, it was the first time that you had a big merger between Random House and Knopf, and Random House had become a publicly traded entity on the stock market. And then that entity ended up getting bought by RCA, which owned, which was a record company. And then like CBS got folded in to, and Viacom and they bought Simon and Schuster. And then like advanced publications would buy Random House later. Yep. And other big c- conglomerates, like obviously Bertelsmann just became this big behemoth, like 
five years ago when it merged Random House and Doubleday and Bantam all together. So all of those things have led up to what is happening now, which is the super mega sizing of big publishers. But also, I'm wondering if we re- we have reached the limit of that. Yeah. Because now that Random House, Penguin Random House can't buy Simon & Schuster, where's SNS going to go? They're a profitable company. Thank Colleen Hoover for however long that gravy train lasts. <laughs> and what are they going to do? Get bought out by private equity that's going to essentially strip them for parts? Yeah, they exactly. Might. Strip them for parts and, and then sell off the name to overstock or something. Yeah. Right. Which is t- a terrible outcome. And yet I completely understand why the Department of Justice put the kibosh on this deal because it would have been too big. Yeah. And it would. But for PRH, it's like, well, we didn't get the merger. And now we're going to start laying people off and giving people generous buyouts. I do wonder if that would have happened anyway, even yeah. if they had bought SNS. Yeah. Because again, if you're operating out of fear, you're going to make decisions that lead to this binge purge quality because yeah. this has happened before. And I'm afraid to say it will happen again. That is something that I've been thinking a lot about because um, from my perspective as a, a blogger, reviewer, podcaster, I am often contacted the most by publicists. So my role is to provide promotion that I am not paid for. Like I get right. paid, I have advertisers. That's a completely different part. But like the content, the reviews, the podcast, that is not paid placement. No one pays me to be on my show. It would be pretty friggin' dope if they did, but it does not happen. And that's fine. because No, we be- know how little publishers mark, uh, earmark for this sort of thing. Oh, yeah, exactly. So I am part of the wing of publishing that relies on unpaid labor of essentially fandom, a very technically advanced skill set um, in a fandom. And I remember with blogs, I'm like, you have to be on this blog tour, be part of our blog tour. First of all, I hate blog tours. I've always hated blog tours. I will never like blog tours. No. I shouldn't laugh. I never did them either. Right? I was like, Wait, wh- wh- why? This is silly. But now you have blogs, well, then you have booktube and then you have bookstagram, bookstagram. and now you have book talk book. and it's the same and then same. you walk into Barnes and Noble and you see the front tables that are all devoted to book talk and it's the same or like at the six, train station six or, the or airport. seven books right six or seven books because the the very limited algorithm the racism and the bias inherent in algorithm and just the idea that once a thing becomes profitable in in attention or money to talk about, more people are going to talk about it. Like that's all part of the same system. And the same thing used to happen with blogs. The same things used to happen with Instagram. It's just now it that- It used to happen in the it, when you had very few conduits for any kind of bestseller, bestselling books. Yes, with absolutely. Books of the month, with, I don't know, drugstores. <laughs> yeah. And it's I remember- same as, it, same as it ever was. The same as it ever was. And I remember talking to Kate Duffy, who was at Kensington before she yes, died. Yes, for a long time. A very long time. And she was telling me that, you know, she would go to Texas and she would meet the book buyer for a grocery store chain in Austin. Then she'd meet the book buyer for the grocery store chain, same chain, but in Houston. And then the chain up in another city was a totally different person, almost always a dude. And what they were trying to sell one of the reasons why, in her opinion, romance covers at that time became just so much boobs and hair is because that's what these dudes thought was sexy. And, you know, buyers have had in the past a great deal of input in what covers look like. I remember hearing... Well, Cecily Hensley, when she was still at Barnes & Noble. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was the kind of thing, if you wrote a novel, it had to be run by Cecily before everybody could sign off on it. Exactly. And Jenny Cruzy told a story about how she was bringing one of her books back into print. And the I think it was the Barnes & Noble buyer said, if you put a dog on the cover, I'll buy like 3,000 more copies. And the publisher It might have like, been Cecily who did that or whoever the romance buyer was. It, I don't remember who the romance I've buyer was. I've heard this story. Right. So and Jenny Cruz is like, there isn't a dog in the story, but fine. But I'll add one? I will stick a dog in this. There's a dog in chapter one and then she goes to a hotel. She doesn't take the dog with her. But is the dog in the suitcase on the cover? Yes, it is. Yes. And so you had all of these buyers and they had so much of an imp- imprint and an, and, a, and an influence on what books would look like. And now there's like how many buyers? One and a half? Four? Maybe four. Maybe. Maybe four. Whoever's at Amazon, whoever's at Barnes & Noble, although I think that's become a little more decentralized. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I- I'm also curious when... The Ripped Bodice opens its store in Brooklyn. Yeah. Which I think is supposed to happen like August, really September. Soon. August, September. Yeah. yeah, very soon. And that's great. Like 
I wish we had more specialized genre bookstores again. I hope that mystery bookstores can come back in a similar fashion. I know that they will never be as pro- prominent as they were in the 80s and 90s. When I moved to New York in 2001, there were four mystery bookshops. Wow. There was the one in my neighborhood in, on the Upper West Side, Murder, Inc. There was one in the Upper East Side, which I hung out at a lot, Black Orchid. There was the one I worked at, Partners in Crime, in <laughs> Greenwich Village. And then there was Mysterious Bookshop, which at the time was in Midtown. Yeah. Now it's in Tribeca. It's the only one left. Yeah. And like, you look at that and you have all of these people with all of this influence. And then with blogging, it was the same sort of, everyone has a everyone has an audience. We have to reach all of these people. But with the promotion end, it was it was an unpaid expectation. No one was paying me to talk about books. And I see, like when you said, this all comes around, it's all cyclical, it's all cyclical. We've reached this point of decentral of, of centralization where there's like, there's three banks and four publishers now. Like we've all, yeah. we've all merged as much as we can, but the use of unpaid fandom labor continues. And I look at book talk people and they're like, you know, how do I ask if there's a budget? How do I ask if there, if I can get paid? How come I can't get paid? And I just want to be like in my little rocking chair in the romance little folks home going, come on over here. I'll tell you exactly what you need to say and who you need to talk to. And yes, you can ask for payment. And if they get mad, then they are being butts and your, your time has value and your skills have value. And if your skills didn't have value, they wouldn't be asking you to do this for free. They would just do them, do it themselves. But, but they, they can't do it themselves. So mm-hmm. they're reaching out to you. And yes, yes exactly. you, <laughs> are you going to be in like a, I hope you're a paid TikTok consultant, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not consulted with any TikTok people yet, but maybe I should be like, listen. That's another business stream. Yeah, I like a good revenue stream because Lord knows you need to diversify those little suckers. So uh, tell me about it. The more you see the sickle, the cyclical nature of publishing, like I have this theory, there's like, we are the sun and you know how planets have different orbits over years. Yes. So we have what, six month issues, one year issues, five year issues, 10 year issues. And the contraction has been, I mean, you said it was like 2008, 2009, the last time everyone got laid off. I mean, there have been layoffs since then, but that was the big one. Yeah. And it kind of feels like this is another big one because everyone's like, you have to come back to the office so that we can lay you off. You have to come back to the office because we're freaked out that we have to pay for this real estate that we should, we actually cannot figure out how to offload because everybody's offloading real estate. But you know what? That's not the problems of the people who work for your company. Thank That's you. That's your problem. Yes, that is your issue to solve and their solution right now is... And if you can't is, solve it, well, too bad for you. No wonder everybody's going on strike. Yeah, no one guaranteed you profitable real estate. Like literally no one does. Even in New York, you can't guarantee that. Especially in New York. Lord, have mercy. So you you see this like this boom and then contraction and then lots of things and then they all merge and there are some things that are all that are constant. What do you think, if you have like a a crystal ball, what do you think might happen in the coming years in publishing? Are we looking at, I mean, any theory is welcome. Well, I'll tell you what I hope for. I always hope for startup companies that remember that it's about books and authors that don't try to publish a million books a season that actually invest in the authors that they acquire that have you know, some degree of marketing and publicity that are just, and are trying different things. Yeah. The problem is that when I have seen examples of this, it often turns out that it's owned by, I don't know, some Coke affiliated person or some other questionable billionaire who then gets bored and pulls all their money. Publisher. Yeah. Right. Um, And pulls all their attention when, pulls all their money when they realize their attention is going elsewhere. Yeah. So how do you create businesses that are sustainable. I also, I mean, this is more of about media properties, but I think that's why journalism in particular has to be more of a nonprofit model. I also, I mean, this is not going to happen because the will is just not strong enough, but you know, when we had a great depression, there was a federal writers project. There was a Uh, federal theater project. This is my favorite part of American history. The Works Progress Administration. Right. I am fascinated by the Works Progress. I could read about it, the rabbit holes I have gone down, and the people who now work to recover works that were part of the Works Progress that are hidden because they don't belong to those collectors. They belong to right. the government. I. All of this is fascinating. The idea, like, we we did a miniature version during COVID. There was we child, did. child tax credit. There was pausing of student loans. There was all of these ways to be like, no, you need money. 
let's make but this happen. Somehow it's like a fever dream, and then people wake up and go, "No, let's means test, and we people don't deserve to have good things, so we're going to take it away." It's like what? But it was working. What it was is the great. Problem, problem? What's wrong with people you, being able to take a deep breath? Fuck's sake. Well, they're just a lot of cruel people who don't want other people to have what they have. Yeah, and it's it sucks. Yep, hubris every time. Hubris every, every time. time. Every time. And you have this sort of. Um, there are there are small presses, especially in romance. There are a number of small presses. There used to be more. But one of the problems that they encounter is, for example, um, Jennifer L. Armentrout writes books mm-hmm. for Blue Box Press. And they are number one in USA Today, back when USA Today was a was a thing. They're, well, uh, hopefully it's a thing again. Fingers, fingers crossed. Back. Speaking of contraction, number one Wall Street Journal, number one Amazon, number one Barnes & Noble. This book is bloody everywhere. And the New York Times will not acknowledge it because they will not acknowledge the press. They will not acknowledge Blue Box Press. And it's like, okay, but like, look, we all know that the New York Times list is made up of like dental floss and farts. And I should say for the record, I have no connection to the New York Times list. It's very opaque to me as it is to everybody else. Oh, I yeah. just write my column. I'm pretty sure the person who actually has a byline in the New York Times book, book uh, bestseller list doesn't have any idea how it's done. I, I wouldn't know. This is where the this is where it's AI. Actually, the list is just all. It's a very <laughs> angry, pissed off AI. But like the 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 book, the bestseller list won't acknowledge the fact that this person has sold literal hundreds of thousands of copies. Yes, but we can't acknowledge that. Why the hell not? So if you have these smaller entities. They also have to fight against an establishment that is very, yeah. very dedicated to preserving a very exclusive club. And that's probably the biggest challenge for publishing, right? The idea that it's it's not exclusive anymore. You're not the only ones who do this. Right. That it actually is much more heterogeneous, even if it doesn't look like the heterogeneity of the past. Yeah. Like how many, first of all, how many books have been published since we started talking? <laughs> right? Like a few. But also how easy... How easy it is to be like, well, you know, I could go through this process this way or I could go through that process this way. But by the end of the year, I could have a published book. You know, that wasn't sure. that wasn't as easily done in the 60s and the 70s and even 25 years ago. No, but even now to get certain kinds of visibility, yeah. you have to have a distributor that is able to get your books in the stores. Exactly. And that is also why Penguin Random House wasn't just consolidating imprints but they were consolidating they were consolidating as a distributor yeah that in order to get your books in the stores you had to have a distributor that had the muscle to have some play with the booksellers and there just aren't that many it's like PRH and Norton and i think SNS was for a while but if they were going to be part of PRH maybe not and that's part of the reason why Harper Collins acquired Harlequin right yes. because Harlequin had global distribution that was their whole thing was distribution, whether it was mail order or having presses all over Europe and Southeast Asia, like they had a distribution thing going on. And they had access to territories that Harper Proper just didn't have the same access have. to. Nope. So it made sense to acquire them just like they did with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Exactly. And, and then screwed all those what's left of over. HMH is not very much. No, it's definitely like Mariner not. Mariner and I mean... Obviously, I've been paying a lot of attention, particularly to the recent, and I'm going to use a big air quotes, retirements of certain romance writers who've been around forever that worked at Harper Imprints, because, you know, it's pretty clear they were pushed out. And it's pretty clear that they didn't want to leave when they did. But you get offered a buyout like that, and you can't refuse it. Because the buyout is very clear. Take this. Or else. Or else. It's a threat. Your it's not work a life will be completely untenable and we will actively make you miserable. Right. And you're too expensive and, and you need to go. Yeah. And just, you know, treating these editors who've been around for decades with such disrespect. And yet that is what book publishing does over and over, over and over again. And over. Yeah. And it, it which always... again is also why people, it's not just that authors can't have a loyalty to a publisher. I mean, it's nice, but. Ultimately, that doesn't get you very far. No. But the people who work in publishing can't have any loyalty because they need to support their families. They need to make ends meet. Yeah. They need to have sustainable jobs. So if the industry doesn't prioritize this, well, that's why there continues to be a brain drain. And the more you cut the work, the workforce without cutting the workload, 
the more you burn out of people. And then, then, then you can replace them with probably independently funded recent graduates who are still sort of starved. Or worse. Or AI. worse. Or AI. Starry-eyed at the idea of publishing or free because of AI technology. Yes. Which is very depressing. I know. And yet, I still am stubbornly optimistic, not so much about the industry, because the industry is going to be weirdly durable in ways I don't think we can ever fully predict. I mean, 15 years ago, there was a piece in New York Magazine called The End. Well, it's 15 years later, clearly publishing has not ended. No. So it will still exist in some form or another. And I just hope that I will have the latitude and the time and the space to just keep doing the work that I'm doing. But more to the point that there's space enough for people to take inspiration from what I'm doing and yes. do their work, because that would be a real tragedy is losing future work by really talented people. Yeah. And it happens, but it doesn't have to be that way. No, no. And the idea that people aren't reading is completely false. Like, right. They're matter, reading all over the place. And and like, for example, my younger child, probably it's what, July, has probably read three million words of fanfic this year. Easily. That, that's great. Like, Easily. that's totally like, reading. All, all the reading all the time. And he's like me when he reads. I have to like shake him to get his attention. <laughs> like, listen, <laughs> I need to put food on the- In your mouth. In your mouth. You're going to pass out. You got to wake up. Like, I'm the same way. If I'm reading, the world is not existing. Yeah. And there's a lot of- you know, there's a, a weird visual homogeneity to books right now. A lot of trade, a lot of blobs, a lot of cartoon covers in romance. So many cartoon covers. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, there is a buying public that has no interest in mass market paperback and is like, oh, a $14 trade? I don't mind if I do. And if you right. had approached me when I was that age buying a book, I'd be like, are you kidding me? That's like four bucks. Right. Yeah, we have a, an audience of people, a community of readers who are like, oh, trade price is no problem. Need to be more expensive than that? I understand. Hardcover, special edition, tell me more. And it's like, but, but, but it, money is- Okay, money. so cater to them. Go, go do the thing. Yeah, mm -mm. nope. And you have all of these, all of these power structures acting against their own best interests in ways that remain baffling, right? Well, that's a specialty of book publishing, I think, too. <laughs> A little bit of head I mean, up the something that something that my old boss Michael Cater used to say is that book publishing was essentially a business built on a hobby. Oh God, that's so true. Yeah, Kate Duffy used to say we're the only industry that continues to work on consignment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How ridiculous is this? That's bonkers. <laughs> and yet, you know, you and me and our rocking chairs, we're still here talking about it. <laughs> Back in my day. Back in oh my, my day. Young whippersnappers, we used to get blog tours. You have to share blog content with a candle site. Dumb. 